Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Bay State Heart and Vascular Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Heidi Zalai. I'm a clinical exercise physiologist here in cardiac rehab in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed our series so far. We think that it's just been fantastic so far this month, as they are every year. Um, but if you've missed any of our talks or you would like to review again any of the talks, um, they are available on our website at baystatehealth.org. Uh, if you'd like to register for next week's presentation, um, you can also do so um, at baystatehealth.org slash heart. Okay. Um, as always, uh, we do welcome your questions. Um, on the right-hand side of your screen, you should see a Q&A area. You can certainly type in questions uh, that are pertinent to this talk, and we will address them at the end of um, our uh, discussion today about women and heart disease. Um, we just ask, as always, to just keep them pertinent to what we're talking about today and try not to make things too personal for yourself so that we can share them um, for everybody. Um, and finally, you will have an opportunity to provide feedback about today's presentation following uh, this WebEx presentation. Uh, so at this time, I'd like um, to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Sabine Chaudhry. Uh, Dr. Chaudhry is a cardiologist here at Bay State Medical Center in Springfield, Massachusetts. She completed her fellowship at Yale University School of Medicine, her residency at Boston Medical Center, and attended medical school at Tufts University School of Medicine. Dr. Chaudhry's topic today, as you can see, will be women and heart disease. We thank you again so much for being with us today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Heidi. I'm really excited to be part of this lecture series and um, particularly to talk about women and heart disease, which I think is such an important topic. Um, I will tell you, it is amazing to me that I went through so much of training and we really didn't specifically address many of these issues. And it's exciting to be at a point where women specifically are being looked at in, cardi in cardiology and in cardiovascular um, disorders to understand the differences that are present. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, sorry. So uh, I hope, I'm not sure if people are aware of this, but heart disease is actually the number one killer of women. Um, I think we spend a lot of time worrying about many other disorders and even things like breast cancer, which many women are aware of their risk. But amazingly, most women are not aware that they may be at risk for heart disease and, in fact, are at 12 times more risk of developing heart disease over their lifetime than their risk of breast cancer. My Goal today is to talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of heart disease. So kind of, you know, how do you get that? What is it and how do you develop it? Some of the signs and symptoms, particularly as they pertain to women, differences in heart disease as it presents in women, and then risk factors for heart disease. And part of that is looking at traditional risk factors like your cholesterol, blood pressure, and how we can make changes in our lifestyle and health to improve our health overall and decrease our risk of heart disease. Cardiovascular disease is a pretty broad term and um, we define it as including coronary heart disease. So things that have to do with heart arteries and plaque buildup and blockage. And that also can extend to stroke where you have plaque buildup in the brain and actually plaque buildup in other vessels, which is peripheral vascular disease. It's the second leading cause of death in women in the ages of 45 to 64 and becomes the leading cause of death in women over the age of 65, as I um, briefly alluded to. One in three women will die of heart disease each year. And I think that's an astounding number when we start to really sit down and think about it. Death rates in younger women age 35 to 54 are increasing for the first time in four decades. And the thought is that a lot of that is being driven by increasing weight, increasing rates of diabetes and high blood pressure, among other risk factors. Um, cardiovascular disease is a group of disorders of the heart and blood vessels, and they can include 
blood vessels in the heart, where we would call it coronary heart disease, in the brain, which is cerebrovascular disease, and as I mentioned, in the peripheral blood vessels, so blood vessels that supply the arms and legs and other organs, where we call it peripheral artery disease. Rheumatic heart disease is included in this bucket, as well as congenital heart disease. Um, and then blood clots in other areas like veins and the lungs um, are under the kind of larger vascular bucket. And these are some of the other medical disorders that can be part of this process. Um, as you can see from this list, I'm not really talking about heart rhythm changes and some of the other types of heart disease that we also see in women and men. Women often will experience different types of symptoms compared to men. Um, while women absolutely do experience chest pain and may have it as frequently as men, we often may describe it differently. And we often may have other symptoms which may be more predominant. And so it's not uncommon to feel a chest pressure or tightness. For some people, it can be a squeezing or burning feeling. That discomfort may be in the chest, but it can also be in the shoulders, the arms, the upper back, and the neck and jaw um, are other areas where you can feel symptoms. The pain may travel down your arms. Um, not uncommonly, you may have shortness of breath with it. And then other kind of broader symptoms that we often will see in women are just an unusual fatigue or tiredness, having nausea or vomiting. Um, dizziness or weakness. And I've definitely had patients describe a feeling of anxiety um, as their predominant symptom. Women often not only present with different symptoms, but the type of heart disease they have may be a little bit different. So classically, we look at the heart arteries as um, tubes and blockage kind of obstructing the lumen of the tube. But we know that for many people, their heart attack or heart symptom may be from blockages or narrowing of the smaller blood vessels. And that's what we call non-obstructive coronary disease. Um, so more women will have this bucket where they may not have significant blockage in one of the larger blood vessels of the heart. And when they have their angiogram, um, that is how we can help diagnose that. Um, more men tend to have obstructive coronary disease. Um, oftentimes, women are not as frequently taken to the cardiac cath lab when they've had their heart attack. And uh, this is an important way that we can help understand the type of heart blockages you may have and what treatments you might need. Um, in medical management, it unfortunately, um, in some areas, women may not get the same prescription of treatment of medications. So we tend to prescribe aspirin, um, beta blockers, another blood pressure medicine called ACE inhibitors, and cholesterol lowering medicines called statins less frequently in women than we do in men. Um, and that's true whether you have blockages that are significant or those that we call non-obstructive. And the rates of death in women are slightly higher than compared to men. And I think these are important um, distinctions just to be aware of, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, and when we look at other ethnicities, um, we also see racial disparities in how women are diagnosed as well as treated for heart disease. Um, so despite having highest rates of heart disease in Black and Latina women, often um, these ethnicities may not be aware that they have a higher likelihood of having a heart attack or stroke. Um, six out of 10 women of color don't even realize that heart disease may be the biggest threat to their health and increase their um, likelihood of dying. Um, one out of two women of color will die of heart disease in the United States. And that number is increasing and that by 2035, it'll be about 50% of women dying of this um, in Black and Latina communities. 
They also have an increased risk of stroke, um, which again, is something that we need to be thinking about and considering. Um, we know when we look at other medical conditions that there are higher rates of being overweight, having diabetes and high blood pressure in many racial communities. Um, and that gap is not only in different ethnicities, but also when you look at the gender um, gap within those communities as well. Um, this is a great uh, little summary from um, the American College of Cardiology that talks about the importance of heart health in women care. So as much as um, there are gaps in knowledge for many patients, um, on the medical community side, there are actually gaps in care for women too. And one of the important reasons to talk about this is to help educate those around us and make us aware of where some of these gaps may be so that we can close those. Um, so when you look at um, heart attacks, so the kind of heart attack where a blood clot may close off the artery, we see that it takes longer for women to get to the cath lab to have that artery opened. Um, when we look at rates of testing with uh, patients who are symptomatic, um, fewer women will go on to be recommended stress testing or other types of tests to evaluate for heart disease. Um, and as I had uh, briefly alluded to earlier, many medical therapies that are so important, not only in primary prevention, so treating someone's risk of heart disease before it happens, but also after they've had a cardiac event, they will have lower rates of prescription for statins, which are a very important cholesterol lowering medication, um, lower rates of blood thinners for atrial fibrillation, um, and then uh, less aggressive treatment of their high blood pressure, um, among other types of treatments. When you look at death rates, we see that death rate is higher in women and when specifically you start to tease that out with people having a heart attack, bypass surgery, congestive heart failure, and angina symptoms, consistently women with any of those types of cardiovascular diseases will have higher rates of death. Um, and that's something we, we don't completely understand. Um, Over the course of our life, we have a number of different um, risks of heart disease and different types of heart disease that may be more pre prevalent at different ages. Um, so this graphic at the top kind of goes over different factors that increase our cardiovascular risk as we age. And on the bottom are different types of cardiac health diseases that may develop um, and become more prevalent at different points in life. So, you know, when we're born and we're children, congenital heart disease is the predominant issue for um, people in that age group. Um, this is an important time where we may be developing our diet and lifestyle. And we know that um, some of those choices from our youth and into adulthood become building blocks for how um, we develop other types of medical issues as we age. And so developing a habit of smoking, having childhood obesity, um, these all increase your risk as you go into adulthood. When we're in our childbearing years, um, a number of disorders of pregnancy increase our risk of cardiovascular disease later in life. So we're just starting to understand that um, high blood pressure during pregnancy, diabetes during pregnancy, preterm delivery um, and preeclampsia will increase our risk of developing heart disease later in life. Um, and then a number of other types of disorders like rheumatologic diseases, um, as well as autoimmune diseases increase risk specifically to women. Um, that again is just starting to be understood as a non-traditional risk factor for developing heart disease. As we're kind of entering into menopause, we start to have issues with more centralized weight gain um, with those hormonal changes and developing other types of metabolic disorders that then increase our risk of developing heart disease, um, whether that is 
the type of blockage that closes down the artery or in those smaller vessels that we, we can't see as well on um, things like angiography. And then when we continue to age, um, many other parts of our heart will age too. And we develop things like heart uh, valvular disease, congestive heart failure becomes more common, um, as well as some of the heart rhythm changes. And you can see also that um, loneliness and social isolation becomes a risk factor as we age and um, may lose some of our community and social connections um, for developing heart disease as well. When we think of developing heart blockages or vascular plaque buildup, um, you know, for years, really, the, the thought was focusing on traditional risk factors, which uh, many of you may be aware of. So things like high blood pressure, smoking, having high cholesterol and diabetes all increase your risk of heart disease. Over the last decade, we're realizing that there are non-traditional risk factors, um, specifically in women, that are increasing our risk of heart disease as well. And these are much less well understood. And when we have menopause will impact that um, changes during pregnancy that contribute to developing gestational diabetes and hypertension or high blood pressure, premature delivery, preeclampsia, autoimmune disorders, and um, rheumatoid arthritis are among some of the other non-traditional risk factors um, where we see higher rates of heart disease in women as they age. Aside from what's called ischemic heart disease, so that's that plaque buildup that you can see at the top of the screen. Um, it, uh, we also are increased risk for ischemic stroke. So that is when our brain isn't getting enough blood flow. Um, our risk of atrial fibrillation increases as we age and especially increases as we gain weight and in patients who are obese. So the BMI number over 30 increases the risk of a number of different heart disorders. Um, we develop more congestive heart failure and that acronym HFPEF, H-F-P-E-F, um, describes congestive heart failure that develops when the heart muscle stiffens. And that happens more commonly as we age. It happens more commonly when we are overweight um, as well as have other types of risk factors like untreated high blood pressure, among other issues. And then peripheral artery disease is when that plaque buildup happens in the blood vessels of other parts of our body. Um, there are a number of mechanisms of disease that are being thought in women in particular, and uh, a big shift occurs as we enter into menopause and we know that estrogen has a lot of really important effects on the body. And when we start to lose estrogen, the thought is that um, some of that is waiting towards many of these cardiovascular disorders progressing and becoming more of an issue with aging. Um, and that this is another way to think about how we go through um, estrogen or hormonal changes. So, you know, the tank's kind of full as we're getting into our 30s. And then um, for many women, we will start to hit perimenopause in our mid and late 40s, um, and then developing menopause around the age of 50 to 60. Um, and as you can see, that amount of estrogen we may have really decreases after 50. That becomes important because on the cardiovascular end, estrogen has a number of different really important effects. It has something we call pleiotropic effects where it impacts different pathways in the body. It has a number of vascular effects that have antioxidant effects. It helps um, increase a compound called nitric oxide, which is important in the compliance or the flexibility of our blood vessels. And then it um, helps regulate smooth muscle relaxation. So that, again, are important components of our blood vessels that help with um, how stiff they get over time and, and how reactive they are. Um, like many things, it's a little bit of a, a balance of making sure that the vascular system can um, 
work at its optimum and not be out of whack in how it proceeds. Um, estrogen may have an antioxidant effect on cholesterol particles in particular. As estrogen decreases, it tends to cause an increase in LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, the kind that helps promote plaque buildup, and decreasing HDL, which is the, the good cholesterol. Um, we know that it does affect the um, immune system as well and may have potential antithrombotic effects, meaning um, it, it helps decrease the risk that you may form a clot. Um, along with a number of anti-inflammatory effects that we don't completely understand. When we take all that together, it becomes important to remember that there are a number of different types of risk factors through our life that will cumulatively increase our risk for developing heart disease. And I think um, it is incredibly important to talk about smoking and the effect that smoking has on the vascular system. Smoking in terms of heart disease causes one out of three cardiovascular deaths. Um, when you combine it with birth control, um, it may increase your risk of cardiovascular disease by over 20%. Um, weight in particular is another very important risk factor for developing heart disease. And um, looking at pregnancy, in particular in women who do not lose most of their pregnancy weight, they are at increased risk for developing heart disease. Increases in bad cholesterol, which is the LDL cholesterol, increase your risk. And as I mentioned earlier, autoimmune disorders like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis um, significantly increase your risk and when you have menopause. Similarly, diabetes and high blood pressure, depression, Pregnancy conditions and um, having premature babies is another um, series of risks that, again, are a little less well understood and something that we're spending a lot more time trying to understand at this time. And then cancer treatments. Um, there are certain cancer treatments that do increase your risk of developing heart disease and um, are important to just be aware of. Globally, when we look at cardiovascular disease, um, this graphic is from an article in The Lancet that kind of divides out different types of heart disease that may be present in parts of the world. The blue and um, purple are that umbrella of cardiovascular disease that we've been talking about. So it includes ischemic heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, cardiomyopathies or weak heart muscles and heart rhythm issues. And you can see that this really takes up the lion's share of what cardiovascular disease may be um, across the world. This red line with the arrow here is where we are. So we're high income North America, and you can see that we're really trailing behind other Western countries in um, our death rates, uh, meaning that more people die in the United States from cardiovascular disease than they do in Europe um, and high income Asian countries. Um, and I think that's important just to take a step back and think about. This graphic, um, again, looking at similar issues, um, taking a look at higher glucose levels, cholesterol, and high blood pressure. So that's where um, these different purple bars make up those risk factors. The greens are higher body mass index. Um, kidney function and lower bone density. And again, here we are for high income North America. We're trailing behind other Western countries um, and higher glucose, cholesterol and blood pressure are making up a very big chunk of what is driving death um, across the world. Sorry, this is a little grainy, but uh, this is just a pictorial of what the traditional thought of coronary heart disease had been um, for really years. Um, and that is primarily focusing on plaque buildup that occurs in what are called the epicardial arteries. So these big arteries that are on the surface of the heart muscle. Um, traditionally, when you have a heart attack or symptoms of a heart blockage, this is where the focus is because when we do angiography, this is what we're seeing. So when you have a procedure called a cardiac catheterization, where we put dye into the heart arteries to see what they look like, 
that dye is going into the lumen. And what we're seeing is areas that may pinch off um, like it does here, where you're not getting enough blood flow past that plaque buildup. Um, we know though, from work over the last 10 to 15 years that the story behind plaque buildup and symptoms of a heart attack, as well as evidence of a heart attack, may be a little bit more complex, especially in women. Um, our arteries start off as large vessels, which are called epicardial arteries, and they actually continue to get smaller and branch down until they become capillaries within the heart muscle. In women, more often, we will see that these tinier arteries may not function normally, and they may give um, plaque buildup along with other functional changes that cause them to pinch off or contract, and that can give you the same symptoms of a heart attack as one of the larger blood vessels, um, but often it may be harder to diagnose. Um, and in women, we see more of that type of presentation. And this graphic just um, describes that a little bit more. So you can see the difference between what's called occlusive heart disease, which is all that junk that's in the bigger part of the artery. Um, and in women, not uncommonly the microcirculation. So all those tiny blood vessels in the muscle may be where you're having other types of um, problems occur that contribute to symptoms and other medical problems. Um, spasming of the artery, where the artery is more irritable, it may pinch um, as a way to block blood flow is also more common in women. And then abnormalities of um, how the vascular system responds, how compliant it is. Um, is more common in women too. Seeing these changes has um, allowed us to create a diagnosis that is relatively new in patients called Minoka and um, its counterpart Inoka, which I will talk about in a minute. But essentially, these are patients who come in with signs of a heart attack and on their angiogram, they may not have any significant heart blockage or um, obstruction to blood flow. So we're understanding now that in some patients that plaque buildup may be from um, the, the tinier blood vessels, It that heart attack may be because of that microvascular dysfunction. So the inability of those tiny blood vessels to uh, be compliant and work normally. Um, having splits in the artery, which are called dissections, is also more common in women, and then spasming, as I mentioned. Um, and we will often see women present with this type of heart attack more commonly than men. There are other types of heart attack syndromes where um, you might have inflammation of the heart muscle that we call myocarditis, and then what's called stress cardiomyopathy. Um, where an emotional or other stressor event will mimic findings of a heart attack and we will see part of the heart muscle not moving normally. Um, both of these entities we also see more commonly in women. In those patients who are presenting with symptoms of heart blockage um, or the heart not getting enough blood flow, a kind of counterpart to Minoka is Inoka. So in this setting, you're having those symptoms of not getting enough blood flow to the heart. But again, the, the bigger arteries all look okay. And the thought is that the smaller arteries are causing the heart muscle not to get enough blood flow. And that's um, what the word ischemia means. Some of these syndromes are not going to be related to the heart. Um, others are going to be related to that microvascular problem. And you're going to hear that word over and over again. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, and this just, again, goes on to um, describe the increasing prevalence of this. So we're seeing more patients with this type of syndrome. Um, we know that it is present in both men and women, though we see it more frequently in women. Um, it can lead to chronic angina symptoms. It can also increase someone's risk of developing congestive heart failure. Many of the risk factors for developing this type of heart issue are similar to 
other types of plaque buildup and blockage. So we think of traditional risk factors. Um, we also think of some more non-traditional ones, which are called endothelial dysfunction. And again, we see that more predominantly in women where the vascular system just seems to stiffen and not respond um, to normal stimuli as well. And particularly once we're postmenopausal, we know that um, that occurs more commonly in women. And this is one of the mechanisms that is thought to drive the increases in heart disease um, and the particular types of heart disease that women may um, have as they age. This graphic just goes over um, and think summarizes everything we've just been talking about um, really well. And this is from a great article in the Journal um, of the American College of Cardiology. And I think many of us have heard traditional risk factors over and over again. So we know that as we get older, if we're smoking, if we have diabetes and high, um, high blood pressure, we're gonna have an increased risk of heart disease. Um, what sometimes again gets lost or is not as well recognized is that many pregnancy outcomes will increase our risk, autoimmune disease, chemotherapy um, in some cases, and radiation can increase your risk. And then those hormonal conditions where um, when we have menopause can increase our risk, things like polycystic ovarian syndrome, and then how our weight is, whether we're obese and particularly that central obesity. So that weight gain, that many women will get around their belly area really increases their risk of heart disease. Our race and ethnicity can be contributors um, and less talked about our income and you know where we might live and how that impacts our risk of heart disease. And um, recent data really has been looking at loneliness and uh, perceived stress, but we know that depression and anxiety and all of these psychosocial or psychological factors increase risk of heart disease as well and are important to be talking about. One of the mechanisms thought to increase risk um, and it's somewhat of a common pathway for all of these different conditions is that when you have these, you're increasing inflammation and that increase in inflammation sets off a series of events at the blood cellular level and the um, blood vessel level that make the blood vessel not function as well. And that can start the process of plaque buildup or what we call atherosclerosis, along with other types of um, vascular problems. And then eventually if that progresses and continues, you'll have a heart attack or develop other types of cardiovascular disease um, and congestive heart failure, stroke, and then sudden death are kind of in that umbrella of disorders that can develop. Looking at heart disease death rates, this is um, a map of the United States, looking at dates from 2015 to 2017. And I would really kind of underscore the darker red areas where you have very high rates of um, adjusted average annual rates of death. Um, we're pretty lucky in the Northeast. We tend to have much lower rates of death, and this is specific to women. Um, but I think this is another graphic or way to look at the increasing rates of um, heart disease in women and particularly mortality. So the rates of death in women um, and where we are as a country. And just briefly, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about congestive heart failure, though this is such a broad topic, it really could be its own talk altogether. Um, the reason I wanted to include this is that same kind of process that we talk about with stiffening of the blood vessels and microvascular disease, as well as many of the risk factors that lead to the heart not getting enough blood flow and having um, heart blockages or heart attacks often goes hand in hand with how and why we develop congestive heart failure. When we have um, a heart attack in some patients, part of the heart muscle may die off and it gives you a reduced ejection fraction, meaning the, the pump part of the heart may not squeeze as well. And when it doesn't squeeze as well, one of the things can, that can develop for some patients is fluid buildup or congestive heart failure. Um, there are also non-heart artery reasons you can have that. And so certain cancer treatments can increase your risk of cardiomyopathy. Pregnancy is another one where we can get a cardiomyopathy and um, 
in COVID times, that would be a remiss not to at least mention COVID as one reason to develop cardiomyopathy as well. Um, but we know that actually really for many viruses, you can develop a inflammation of the heart muscle and then um, develop a weak heart muscle. Many of the strategies we use to treat heart disease also are really important for reducing your risk of heart failure. So not smoking, having good cholesterol management and blood pressure control, being at a healthy weight and having diabetes controlled well are really important in managing congestive heart failure. And exercise, I think, um, doesn't get spoken about enough, but it is such a critical part of how we reduce our risk of many types of heart disease, including congestive heart failure, um, as well as heart attacks and heart blockage issues. Um, and this top graphic is looking at for people with low, weak heart muscles, how do we reduce their risk of developing heart failure um, as they age? And there are quite a few studies looking at exercise as well as getting to a healthy weight and weight loss as very important ways we reduce risk of developing congestive heart failure. The bottom graphic looks at those same issues in people who have normal heart muscle function. So it pumps just fine. It's just getting stiff. Um, some of that stiffening happens with aging. Some of it is thought to be related to increased inflammation and that endothelial function. So how our blood vessels are behaving and how compliant they are. As those types of processes are going on, they can cause scarring within the heart muscle that we call fibrosis. Um, diabetes and insulin resistance are thought to be contributors to some of these processes, as well as that microvascular disease that I had mentioned earlier. Again, exercise and being at a healthy weight are really, really important in helping reduce our risk of developing congestive heart failure as we get older. Um, having atrial fibrillation and not having that well treated may go hand in hand with congestive heart failure development. But then also um, when you've had congestive heart failure, atrial fibrillation seems to not be as well tolerated. And so there um, is a back and forth of what those two types of disorders can compound in, in symptoms and how people will feel. Um, again, blood pressure management is incredibly important and where we have our weight. And so um, for many women after menopause, it becomes more common to gain that belly weight. And that is just not healthy for us for many reasons. Um, there have been a number of um, studies looking at improved um, in losing weight as we age as uh, having a very big impact on rates of congestive heart failure development uh, through aging and lifespan. And so that is another area where I think we need to really remember how important it is to get up and move and have regular exercise. Um, a particular study looking at the atherosclerotic risk in communities study looked at the American Heart Association's simple seven guidelines and in really incorporating regular activity, healthy diet, being at a healthy weight, and making sure things like your cholesterol and blood pressure were adequately managed and your blood sugar was adequately managed. And they saw a lifetime heart failure risk reduction from 48.7% to 13% in women um, and men who were adequately managed for these different risk factors. And I think that's a really important number to think about. Obesity in particular is specifically associated with developing congestive heart failure with normal heart muscle function. Um, the th thought is that there's more pro-inflammatory events that are happening and insulin resistance and microvascular dysfunction um, can go hand in hand, and that contributes to why the heart muscle just stiffens and doesn't um, pump low, uh, increases the risk of congestive heart failure developing. A large trial strictly in bariatric patients um, looked at a 10 kilogram weight reduction and saw that the studied group risk of congestive heart failure decreased by 23%, um, just to underscore the importance of weight in the development of this disorder. Sorry about that. 
And then um, more recently, we've really been doing more studying of depression, um, social isolation, and um, loneliness in mechanisms of developing cardiovascular disease. So I wanted to at least include one slide on the importance of this. Um, this study was done in 2014, and just thinking of different mechanisms that may contribute to cardiovascular disease. And I think a lot of this, again, has to do with that pro-inflammatory and um, uh, mechanisms that go with that inflammation that occurs when you have higher amounts of cortisol and um, other types of um, hormonal changes that occur when we're chronically under stress, which um, depression may contribute to. Social isolation and anxiety can be um, similar in how they behave. And another thought is that when people are depressed, when they're socially isolated, they may not be eating as well. They may not be taking their medications regularly or um, have more smoking and more inactivity. And again, all, all of those then increase your risk of heart disease because you're increasing the presence of other types of traditional risk factors. So what can we do about this? Um, so I think it becomes really important to start thinking about how we um, are living our life and making sure we're doing everything we can to treat things that are in our control. So some of what I mentioned, we don't completely have control over, but exercising reg regularly, having a healthy lifestyle, not smoking, eating a healthy diet are absolutely things that are in our control. Um, that become even more important to reduce your risk of developing heart disease, congestive heart failure, atrial fibrillation, among uh, a lot of other cardiac conditions. This is a great little graphic, just thinking about the different components of how we want to prevent heart disease and looking at blood pressure management. So you want to have blood pressure guideline goals of less than 130 over 80 millimeters mercury is important. Um, I'll start, I should have started with A, which is aspirin, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a few slides. But um, the guidelines around aspirin have changed, and it is not universally re recommended for primary prevention at this time. Um, the Cs of this graphic are cholesterol, so knowing what your risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is. So that's that uh, plaque buildup that we've been talking about. Think about what in your personal history may increase your risk, and then thinking about other tools like calcium scores as a way to help understand what a patient's particular risk of heart disease may be, and whether it makes sense for them to get started on medication management, um, among other treatments. Not smoking is very important. Our diet is important, and really having um, an emphasis on plant-based diet, having increasing vegetable, fruits, nuts, legumes, whole grains, um, and fish as an uh, important cornerstone of how we're eating. Um, controlling diabetes and certain medications in particular, which have been shown to decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease. And then regular exercise. Um, the American College of Cardiology is recommending at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity a week. Um, or 75 minutes of vigorous physical activity a week as uh, just a basic amount. Taking a step to talk a little bit about obesity, I wanted to um, really take a minute to look at these graphics. I think sometimes what gets lost for many of us is um, you know, where we are as a nation with the progressing weight gain and um, what obesity is doing and in increasing our risk of developing heart disease among a lot of other medical problems. When you look back um, to this graphic on the left, so this 1990 here, um, you see that most of the country is in blue. In blue, the highest percentage of obesity in a particular state was about 10 to 15%, and that's that darker blue level that you'll see in the, the Southern Belt. Um, by 1999, that's already gone to 20 to 34%. Um, and then in the early 2000s, we're now at about 20 to 25%. Um, 
and you can see our current graphic here, there is really no part of the country that has less than 20 to 25% obesity. And, and for many parts of the country, we're at about 30 to 35% of the population being classified as obese. The more fruits and vegetables, the better. And I think a rainbow diet is a great way to think about how eating healthy is important for all of us. Um, the DASH diet is uh, one in particular that the American of Col College of Cardiology and American Heart Association support. And it has been shown to really help reduce your um, risk of developing high blood pressure and improve your high blood pressure if you already have it. Um, and really the kind of cornerstone is similar to what I've been talking about. So you want your plate to be largely fruits and vegetables or carbohydrates. You want complex whole grain carbohydrates, um, less frequent servings of dairy and higher saturated foods. So things like sweets you really want to be having infrequently. Um, and you want your protein sources to be a combination of plant-based protein and then um, ideally poultry and fish, so the more lean proteins um, for your overall heart health. And a big part of this is also watching your sodium intake and um, the most recent guidelines from the American Heart Association would recommend that all of us be under 1500 milligrams of sodium, which is not much at all for everything that you eat over the course of a day. Our blood pressure recommendations have changed a little bit over the years, and the most recent guideline iteration is in this graphic. High blood pressure is considered blood pressure greater than 130 over 80. If you are in between 120 to 130 for that systolic, so that top number blood pressure, you're considered to have elevated blood pressure and be in a pre-high blood pressure range. Um, so really anything in this kind of orange to red, you want to make sure we're talking about with your doctor and then consideration for medication therapy. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second as well. We know that high blood pressure has a particularly um, higher impact on female cardiovascular health and changes in blood pressure for women seem to decrease cardiovascular events more than they do in men. Um, one trial looked at this, and in particular, if we could decrease someone's blood pressure by 10 millimeters mercury or more, it had an impact of decreasing cardiovascular deaths by 10%, uh, which is not a small thing. And that benefit was not seen in men. Often women will have a steeper rise in their blood pressure as they age, um, and that can start even as early as our 30s. And again, the, the thought is that there's a change or a difference in vascular aging and that potentially estrogen, changes in estrogen may be part of why that's happening. The Framingham Heart Study from uh, the early 90s looked at changes in blood pressure and its impact on cardiovascular disease. And this is in patients with and without um, glucose intolerance, meaning uh, either a trend towards diabetes or diabetes. And pretty consistently, you'll see that as your blood pressure rises, your rate of heart events goes up as well. So high blood pressure and elevated sugar together, um, they're just not good for you and they're not good for your heart. Often initial attempts um, when we do see that your blood pressure is a little elevated may focus on lifestyle modification. And I just wanted to include this a little bit to talk about for those non-medication things that we recommend to someone, how much benefit are you really going to see? So weight loss in general, if you can lose um, several pounds of weight at least, you'll get about a millimeter mercury for every two pounds reduction in body weight. In terms of the DASH diet, switching to the DASH diet may decrease that blood pressure number by about 10 to 11 millimeters mercury if you have high blood pressure. Um, and changes in sodium, so going down to 1,500 milligrams of sodium can bring down your blood pressure by 5 to 6 millimeters mercury. Increasing potassium can help as well. 
Um, and that, again, has to do with some of that vascular compliance. Um, increasing physical activity will help anywhere from 5 to 10, uh, 5 to 8 millimeters mercury in improving high blood pressure readings. And reducing alcohol is another important way that we can improve our blood pressure. You'll see in this graphic that even with people with normal blood pressures, if they follow a healthy lifestyle and make some of these changes, they will see a reduction in their blood pressure numbers as well. Um, and that's important just to keep in mind. So how to know what to do and when. This is um, from the most recent American College of Cardiology and AHA guideline recommendations for blood pressure management. And it kind of helps us group people into different categories. So there are those who have either normal blood pressure or in that borderline range where initially the recommendations are going to be lifestyle modification and then just keeping a close eye on things if you're in that 120 to 129 range for blood pressure. In some patients, if they're consistently staying elevated, we may want to um, talk about watching lifestyle, decreasing alcohol, increasing exercise and activity. And so that non-pharmacologic bucket of um, lifestyle changes that becomes very important and then keeping a close eye on where their blood pressure is heading. And if this is a trend that then gets you into stage one or stage two hypertension, um, really thinking that not only are the non-pharmacologic therapies so that lifestyle modification is incredibly important, but we want to be thinking about starting medications as well. Um, one of the important things I would just highlight about this, different um, governing bodies may approach blood pressure a little differently. So when you look at the European cardiology um, society, they actually are a little bit more aggressive in when they treat high blood pressure. And pretty consistently when someone is in the 130 to 80 range, you're recommending lifestyle changes, but you're pretty much concomitantly also starting blood pressure medications. Um, and they're not waiting just for um, people to be consistently over 140, over 90. Um, I think most of us have fallen into treating patients in stage one hypertension with medications as well as lifestyle changes, um, and then making adjustments from there to get their blood pressure as well controlled as possible. Switching gears a little bit and talking about cholesterol management, the um, guidelines for cholesterol management have also changed over the last decade, and um, we have a great risk assessor now called the pooled cohort equation. Um, and essentially, this is a graphic that shows you a little bit what it looks like. We plug in someone's gender, age, what their blood pressure is at the visit, um, some limited race information, and then whether they have high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, with their cholesterol um, data, and it helps us predict a 10-year risk of heart disease development as well as a lifetime risk. The lifetime risk is um, a little bit narrow in the population that it can be used for, but really the 10-year risk is what we use to help address whether statin therapy or other types of lifestyle modification will be helpful in reducing your risk of heart disease. This is a similar graphic from um, the Journal of American College of Cardiology that looks at kind of different buckets of where your cholesterol may be and other risk factors that you have and when we need to start thinking about treating high cholesterol. Um, and I think, you know, one of the important things to remember is that when we're young, our risk of heart disease is relatively low. And for many patients, the first line management is going to be lifestyle modification and really thinking about um, healthier diet choices and regular exercise. In some patients who have very strong family history of premature heart disease or have kind of absolute um, cutoffs based on their LDL for very elevated LDL numbers, we may start to recommend statin therapy even at an early age. Those same numbers by the time you're over 40 and definitely when you're over 65, because the 10 year risk of heart disease becomes so much higher as we age, that risk discussion starts to change a little bit. And then um, you're kind of in this tier of looking at, all right, where are you in your, that 10-year risk number? And when should we be starting to think about statin therapy? 
And greater than seven and a half percent is generally where we start to see um, a higher inflection of heart disease risk, where we want to be recommending, along with lifestyle modification, statin therapy to help reduce your risk of heart attacks and um, other types of cardiovascular events. And when you're above that 20% risk, you really the recommendation is to start a statin because it is so important in reducing our risk of heart disease. You'll notice with that last graphic that, um, sorry, just to go back a second, um, you know, the algorithm does not include things like family history. A lot of the risk enhancers that we talked about, particularly to women, um, whether it is the pregnancy related risks that we may have, autoimmune disorders, um, those aren't part of this bucket. So for many patients, we kind of use the pooled cohort equation as a starting point of where their risk may be. And then I think it becomes very important to individualize that and look at other risk factors that aren't part of that algorithm that may sway us to say, it's time to think about starting a statin or make other changes uh, because your risk may be higher than what this risk calculator is suggesting. Um, another way to look at how to think about when to start statin therapy. For those patients who um, have already had a cardiac event, it is an absolute yes. This is an important part of how we treat heart disease once you've had a heart event. If your LDL or bad cholesterol is greater than 190, that's another absolute indication that you should be on a statin. Um, for diabetes, because diabetes is considered uh, to have such a high risk of developing heart disease, we kind of put that in that same bucket. For primary prevention, so those patients who over the age of 40 to 75 um, may be at higher risk, um, those higher percentages that I was showing, so 7.5% to 20% puts you at intermediate risk. And um, depending on what other risk factors you have, it becomes important to start a statin. And then definitely if you're above 20%. The reason this cutoff is at 75 is because we don't really have great age-specific data after that. There is one small trial that came out after um, these guidelines were released that suggests in geriatric populations, statins do decrease risk of heart disease and are an important part of um, managing risk reduction. For a hard no, um, for those patients who may have less than 5% risk of cardiovascular disease, we do not recommend starting statins. And then for patients who are pregnant, it is important to remember this is um, not a medication that we typically use in pregnancy. For primary prevention, which is that middle bucket, when you're in that indeterminate kind of intermediate range of risk, five to seven and a half percent. This is um, another important place where talking through with your physician about what your personal risk may be. Do you have other risk factors that aren't part of that pooled cohort equation um, that make it important to think about starting a statin earlier versus later? And um, getting to aspirin. So, you know, for years we had uh, recommended, particularly in men, that aspirin was helpful in reducing the risk of heart disease um, and primary events. A series of large trials looking at this um, have not shown benefit. And so the guidelines really changed a number of years ago so that if you've never had a heart attack or stroke, we are not routinely recommending taking a baby aspirin. Part of the concern is that uh, these trials had shown uh, increased risk of bleeding. And so, you know, we're taking a medication now that's not really showing much benefit, but could potentially increase your risk of harm. And so that's where um, the, the change becomes important. In someone who has had a heart attack or stroke, aspirin has very strongly been shown to decrease your risk of another event. And it is the main, a mainstay medication in what we recommend lifelong for treatment um, in that primary prevention bucket. Um, so while for most people we're saying that it really doesn't have much benefit, there, um, like many things, is always a maybe. And the maybe may be someone who has a number of other risk factors where they're not quite in a low risk group and they may not have had an event yet, but you're concerned enough about their various risk factors that continuing on a baby aspirin um, as shared decision-making may be reasonable. 
And I think what becomes important is knowing what your particular risk for bleeding may be um, and if it makes sense to continue on a, a blood thinner despite that. So people who are smoking, this is where calcium scores can be very helpful. So if you have an elevated calcium score, a strong family history of heart disease, um, other risk factors, including diabetes and high blood pressure and high cholesterol um, and your low risk for bleeding, it may not be unreasonable. The European guidelines would again say that you don't need aspirin. So this is another place where we differ a little bit with what the European Heart Association has recommended. Some other tests that can be helpful in assessing non-traditional risk factors. There are blood tests called homocysteine and cardiac CRP, which are inflammatory markers. And in some patients, when they're elevated, um, they've been correlated with higher rates of heart disease development. So if your cholesterol isn't too bad and you're on the fence, you're not really sure um, whether you should be starting a statin, these are blood tests that I will often send to get a better sense of you know, what someone's individual risk may be and um, have a better conversation with the patient about um, choices that they may want to make for management. Calcium score is another really helpful test in guiding for those patients who may be in that intermediate or grade bucket. Um, are there findings on a calcium score that would sway us to recommend statin therapy? Um, and then, you know, thinking about those uh, female specific and then non-specific risk factors like depression and depression screening um, as important markers that we should be looking at. Excuse me. So this graphic, um, I think, helps kind of understand calcium scoring in terms of what it does and doesn't do. So really, um, if you're already recommended a statin because you have a very high 10-year risk of heart disease development, um, or if you have other reasons that you should be recommended a statin, the addition of a calcium score really is not going to change much. So even if your calcium score was zero, you have other reasons that we would recommend a statin, and it's just not effective as uh, a way to gauge that. If you're at a very low risk, um, again, the addition of a calcium score probably isn't going to change the fact that you are in a low risk group and um, may not be helpful to get. For those intermediate patients, so their risk is somewhere between 5 and 20 percent. Um, maybe they have some risk factors, but other things are absent or, you know, based on patient preference, they may not be eager to start a medication the calcium score can help us kind of reclassify people either increasing their risk or decreasing their risk. And I think this is where it has the most benefit in helping someone make a decision for themselves. So that um, if they're in these buckets, kind of using that as an additional way to say, okay, your calcium score was really high. Geez, maybe we should be thinking about that statin now or vice versa and um, downgrading what your classification is so that we can hold off on that and continue with lifestyle modification and other types of um, medical therapies and lifestyle changes. And just to kind of get back to this graphic, because I do think it's so important to remember all the different reasons um, that we go on to develop heart disease, aside from the well-established risk factors, which is this middle bucket that we keep talking about, um, these are also the ones that tend to be the most modifiable, so they're important to talk about. Um, we have gender-specific risk factors, so things like when you have menopause, gestational diabetes, a whole slew of pregnancy disorders and um, autoimmune disorders, as well as PCOS, and then the psychosocial ones that um, are just really starting to be talked about more, where depression, um, chronic um, environmental changes, abuse, social isolation, um, and socioeconomic components may be contributing to whether someone develops heart disease. My hope is that as time goes on, um, you know, we will have more awareness of heart disease as the number one killer of women. But then I think the other really important issue that this uh, graphic helps talk about is um, 
having more women understand this as a risk, having more women hopefully um, be willing to talk to their doctors about it. I find it um, disheartening that, you know, you have 26% of women in this trial that were embarrassed to talk about their heart disease risk. Um, and some of that is because they were worried about weight. And we know that in many cases, women may not seek medical attention because they don't want to be weighed or they're uh, embarrassed about the weight they're at. And I think it becomes even more important to destigmatize that as a risk so that we can get patients the primary prevention and preventative care that is so important to helping all of us stay healthy as we age. Um, only 40% of women actually had a uh, heart disease risk check as part of their routine care. Um, about that percent of primary care physicians made heart disease prevention and uh, management a top priority. And even among cardiologists, only 42 percent uh, felt prepared to assess cardiovascular disease in women. And I think all of this needs to change. Um, so hopefully as we talk more about this during um, not only heart month, but through the year, um, I would really encourage everyone to bring this up with their regular doctors and, you know, talk about it in their friend circle and social communities so that we can increase awareness and um, destigmatize many of these issues and feel comfortable talking about it. Um, and then on the medical system um, side, it's so important to invest in heart disease research and include particularly women in many of these trials, um, which is part of the reason why some of our data is lacking. Um, and I, I think there's been a really great emphasis on making those changes over the last decade and, and really optimistic that the next 10 years will bring us even more information and understanding of how heart disease may be different in women. Um, and I just wanted to kind of get back to that graphic about what is different and how we might feel. So women, again, while often you will have chest pain, you may feel more upper neck, jaw, back pain. Um, you may feel pressure in your upper belly. Often people will have trouble breathing, feeling faint, indigestion, having nausea, vomiting, or that really extreme fatigue and feeling off. Um, so if any of those are happening, that is definitely something to seek medical attention for. Um, and the um, American College of Cardiology has a great website for patient information called cardiosmart.org. Um, I would really encourage all of you to, to read up on some heart topics there. Um, this is my favorite graphic because I think being your own heart hero is so important. And I would really encourage everyone to advocate for their own health, understand what these health issues are, and make it a priority to talk to your regular provider about it um, so you can really make good decisions and um, make good lifestyle choices. Um, and the American Heart Association also has some great um, advice and uh, programs for patients as well. So I would encourage you to, to look at their website um, and don't forget about taking care of yourself and self-care. And I think preventative medicine is a really, really important part of how we, how we do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chaudhry. That was just fantastic, all the information. Um, as one woman of myself, I feel certainly um, more armed with wonderful information. And, and I, you know, I will certainly be reviewing this uh, presentation as well to write down the questions that I should be asking my doctor when I see the doctor. Uh, yeah. What are my risks? Or do these things pertain to me? Should I have these tests um, coming up? What does this mean for me in, you know, my family history? So thank you so much for, again, arming us with additional information. Sometimes we we don't know what we don't know, and we don't know what to ask. So it's it's fantastic. Um, we do have some questions. I know that we are over time, so I thank you for those that um, are staying on with us. Um, and uh, if you don't mind, we'll just go through um, a few of these here. Um, in the beginning of your presentation, you did talk about the obstructive and non-obstructive um, concerns uh, with women. Um, someone had asked if the uh, symptoms are the same for um, somebody who's dealing with the obstructive versus non-obstructive heart disease. They can be. So, you know, often what the um, the underlying symptoms may be very similar, whether you're having a heart attack or it's more of a chronic anginal symptom can be a little bit different. But um, 
it can be sudden. You can absolutely have chest discomfort or that kind of litany of things I was describing, pressure in the arms, back, nausea, trouble breathing, extreme fatigue with activities. Um, And then it is not until we do more medical testing that we see that the bigger arteries may be okay or not okay as the cause of what you're feeling. Um, So what you feel is not uncommonly similar. Uh, You talked also about the um, difference in the the treatment of obviously men versus women. And we know we've come some way, we still have a way to go. Um, but do you feel that the, the gaps in treatment are due to the way that we describe things, um, describe our symptoms differently, or do you think it's from something else? You know, I, it's hard to know. I think it's complicated. I think absolutely, as women, we often will describe things differently. Um, but I think it's important not to put this solely in the patient's lap, because I, I don't think that's the case. And I think there are kind of institutional biases that are there that, you know, like many other industries and communities were kind of realizing they're woven into the fabric of the system. And we're just starting to really um, understand that we, we need to take a step back and look at what bias might be there on our end that is contributing to this. We're very lucky in the Northeast. I have a hard time believing that those numbers pertain to us. Um, but I know, you know, regionally within the United States, things can be very different in access to medical care. And um, it, it doesn't completely surprise me to see that there are gaps there. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions that I think are linked. Um, you had talked about metabolic disorders, and then somebody talked also about subclinical hypothyroid um, in, in back. And I think they kind of go together. Yeah, a little bit. So, you know, metabolic disease in this case um, is more metabolic syndrome, which is kind of a um, prevariant of diabetes where people can have that central obesity. Um, They can have elevated cholesterol or lipid numbers and then elevated blood sugars. So they're not frankly diabetic yet, but they have a lot of the components that are in that prediabetes. Hypothyroid itself, I'm not aware of as being a contributor for plaque buildup or um, the Minoka Inoka type of event that I was mentioning. There are other types of issues that untreated thyroid disease can contribute to, um, but generally, if you're treated, that should not be a problem. Um, I'm going to skip over. We did, do have a question about PAD. However, we have a whole presentation next week about yeah. PAD, so I'm going to skip over that, and I'm, I apologize, but I do encourage um, uh, logging on for those that are interested in the PAD next week because there'll be all kinds of information about uh, PAD, leg cramping, things like that. Um, right. uh, someone had brought up uh, premature um, heartbeats um, and how concerning are these? So it you know depends on the company that it keeps. And we can get premature heartbeats from the upper chamber of the heart as well as the bottom chamber. We worry a little bit more about the bottom chamber ones because in some patients, they can be associated with other heart problems. Um, whether it's a weak heart muscle or heart blockages. In many patients, they're completely benign. So depending on the frequency that you're having it and what other things we find on heart testing, um, there are different ways that they get managed. And the spectrum can be anywhere from benign to a little bit more concerning. So it's important if you're feeling it just to talk to your primary care provider um, as a good place to start. And Um, tests like a Holter monitor and an ultrasound of the heart can give us a lot of information about whether this is something we need to worry more about or make other recommendations for. Um, The uh, symptoms of with Minoka, which is really an MI non-obstructive coronary artery disease. Um, Are the symptoms the same as a heart attack? Yes. Yep, exactly. So the symptoms are the same. And then, you know, what's happening is you're going in, we may see that blood test abnormality to show us that you've had a heart attack. When we go ahead to do tests to look at the heart arteries, the bigger arteries all look fine. Um, You know, 20 years ago, we would tell people that they didn't really have a heart problem. And it's only been in the last kind of 15 plus years that we're realizing, oh, those symptoms are real. The the problem is there. We just didn't have the test to understand what it meant. Um, And now it has a name. Um, AFib and heart failure. Um, We know that we kind of talked about heart failure and AFib, but can AFib kind of lead heart failure too? 
Yeah. So it, again, it, it depends on the company that keeps a little bit. So you absolutely can have AFib that's well controlled that doesn't necessarily lead to other types of medical problems. Um, in some patients, they just don't tolerate the atrial fibrillation very well. Or if they are having very fast heart rates and we're not doing a very good job of controlling their heart rates, it can lead to congestive heart failure. Um, so it is a broad bucket and not everyone kind of falls in that path where one thing will absolutely cause the other. Um, and there are ways to treat it and have it be much less of an issue. Um, the lipoprotein A or the LPA, I know it was on one of your slides when you were talking yeah. about cholesterol. Do you, it's not something that we know is a regular part of our lipid panel, right. but is that something that you recommend women specifically have um, so, tested for? I use it if someone has a lot of risk factors um, and their LDL otherwise is normal. If your LDL is really elevated, it doesn't really matter what your smaller protein particles are because you're already kind of hitting that benchmark where we're putting you in a high risk category. The patients who I find that it's a little bit more helpful with are those whose cholesterol numbers really don't look that bad, but maybe they have other risk factors. So, you know, every person in their family has had a heart attack and um, they have uh, high blood pressure and maybe not other reasons that I would be recommending a statin. If I see that their lipoprotein A is also elevated, then I think it helps open that door to say, okay, you, now you're in that higher risk bucket. So just like we use a calcium score or use some of the other um, non-traditional risk factors to better get a sense of where your 10-year risk would be, um, I think that's particularly helpful in that bucket. There have been some studies looking at people who already have had cardiac events and whether kind of following the lipoprotein A is more helpful. And I think it's a little bit of wash, partly because we don't have particular medication treatments for it. So unfortunately, while we know that that is a very important driver of heart disease and how well someone may do in the management of heart disease, other than statins, we don't have cholesterol lowering medicines that in particular will target that. Um, Hopefully that will change, uh, but that is where I think it becomes less helpful to focus too much on it if you already have indications to be on a statin. Um, kind of a simple question. Somebody asked about CRP or C-reactive protein. Is that just a blood test? Just a blood test, yep. So cardiac CRP in particular is the one that um, I recommend doing along with homocysteine as a way to you know, gauge if you have other non-traditional risk factors that would make us recommend a statin. Um, and then one about oral contraceptives. Um, does the risk from oral contraceptives, once you stop taking them, do they have lingering effects still? Is your risk still the same? Yeah, so they don't. So it really is about the time that you're taking it that it can increase your risk of clot development. Um, and you, you talked about the, the early beats. Again, this was a PVCs, um, premature ventricular contractions. Do they add to your risk of a heart attack? That's a great question. So generally not. Um, I think the concern more is that they can be a symptom of significant heart blockages and not so much the cause of it. Um, so in many people who either um, are having a heart attack, it can have more of a sustained ventricular arrhythmia, so a heart rhythm that originates from the bottom chamber of the heart. Um, those are the ones that cause that sudden death. That's not what a PVC is, but a PVC is an isolated beat from the bottom chamber. In and of itself, that doesn't cause a heart blockage, but in people with heart blockages, you may see a lot of those PVCs um, as more of a marker that you know something else is going on. Um, we have a whole bunch more questions, but I'm actually going to cut it here. We'll see if we can possibly get um, these questions answered and possibly have them posted. I can't guarantee it, but we would certainly love to have um, a lot of these others um, answered as well. Um, I do encourage um, everybody, if you need to kind of review this information, there was a lot of great information included in your slides, too. Um, that, uh, you know, if we kind of delve deeper, you may have your, your questions answered. Um, so I definitely encourage that. Um, but at this time, I just want to really thank you for your information today. Um, again, yeah. hugely beneficial to, to everybody, men and women, you know, people that, um, you know, us as women, obviously, but certainly caretakers and, and the husbands yeah. of, of these women that might have to deal, unfortunately, with an event or moms and 
and dads and things. So uh, we certainly yeah, appreciate it. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's important for all of us to hear, right? It can't just be a women's solution and a women's problem. We all need to be part of this. Um, and I would really encourage people to look at the American Heart Association and that cardiosmart.org. Those are great websites to get information. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much. Uh, we'll have Dr. Um, Blackwell next week. He's going to be talking about, again, vascular um, topics, uh, cramp, leg cramping and PAD, which will be kind of an extension of, of this heart disease that we've been uh, talking so much about. So again, Dr. Chaudhry, I thank you so much for being with us today. And I thank all of our participants for being with us today. It's been a great presentation. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.